uh, let's get started uh, tonight and beautiful evening. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. Specifically, I pray for this weekend that we get the gospel message out to as many people as possible. That's really been on my heart for, well, for the whole month. And no better time to give the full gospel message than now. So let's pray for that, would you? Let's join together. Also remember Kendra uh, Jax is in uh, Turkey having surgery this week. And God be with her. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this assembly. Thank you for your word. We're asking that you, Lord, would uh, be glorified in this Bible study. Walk us through the scripture. I ask, Lord, that you would uh, help us, help City Mission and the people of City Mission to be very strategic and diligent about getting the message to as many possible, Lord, this weekend and the rest of this week. Lord, let us revisit the cross and the resurrection, and let's tell it like we're excited about it, like it happened yesterday. Lord, I'm asking you to touch Kendra. Father, be with her. Give her uh, faith and encouragement and quick healing. Uh, in the name of the Lord, we pray, keep her in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I, I was tempted to start teaching into chapter 10. It says on here we're going into chapter 10, but I chose to hesitate because chapter 10 is such a vital, doctrinal, pivotal moment in the book of Acts and the church history, uh, I just didn't want to rush into it. So, so we'll see what happens. But tonight, I'm going to finish uh, chapter 9. So here's some things that we need to remember. Uh, chapter 9 is, again, pivotal. It is a switching in the early history of the church because it records the conversion uh, of Saul. And uh, so if, if those of you that were here last week or if you watched online, uh, Saul is on his way to persecute Christians. Uh, he uh, is arrested by Jesus on the road on the way to Damascus. We learned last week it was right outside of Damascus. He was almost there. Uh, he was, it's a two-week trip uh, on foot, and he's there outside the city, and Jesus shows up in his bright light and knocks him on his back. Uh, he doesn't see Jesus in form. He sees this bright light and he hears his voice. Jesus uh, confronts Saul about persecuting him, even though it was his church he was persecuting. Uh, this is really the first time doctrinally that Jesus equates the church with himself, his body. And, um, and so... Uh, Saul asked Jesus, what do I need to do? He said, go into Damascus and wait because I have somebody you need to meet. He's going to tell you what you need to do. His name's Ananias. Now, uh, let me ask this question. Who remembers from last week? Did Saul get converted on the road to Damascus? Uh, he did not. Uh, Jesus didn't say, repent of your sins, be baptized. He didn't say, uh, you know, uh, here's what you need to do to be saved and be filled with the Spirit. No, he said, here's what you do. You go to Ananias, he's going to tell you what to do. So Saul, we always talk about the conversion of Saul on the road to Damascus. He wasn't. Uh, he wasn't converted until he goes to Ananias and they explain to him the way of salvation. Now, he's a believer. He knows Christ is at this point, there's no doubt. Uh, but he hasn't responded by faith and obedience, right? But, but I love the image. We ended with this thought last week that while God was, Jesus was speaking to Saul, he was also by the Spirit speaking to Ananias. Hey, I'm sending someone to you. And when you come, he comes, you need to uh, pray for him. I, I remember, and then he gives Ananias a prophetic word. And so while he's doing one thing here, he's doing another here, and it shows how God works. Uh, you know, a lot of times we're praying for this, and we're engaged here, and God's already answering over there. He's working on that person. He's working on this person. He, he's visiting this person, and he's setting things up. And then he brings everyone together for this, you know, manifestation of answered prayer. 
It's beautiful. And I've been serving God long enough to see this pattern work over and over and over and over in people's lives in my own life. All things coming together uh, for one big manifestation of answered prayer. And so here's what happens. Um, he sends him to a street called Straight Street. And I think I may have mentioned this last week that this street still exists. Uh, you can go to the modern city of Damascus where um, Paul went to and uh, the street is still there. It's called another name now. Uh, it's a name that uh, is called the Street of the Bazaars because it's a market street now. But everyone knows that it's the historic Straight Street. There's also a house there that they take tourists to. And it's supposed to be the house of Judas where Paul stayed waiting for Ananias, all right, or Saul. Um, so, um, so let me ask you all this, and I may have asked last week, uh, why, why would God choose Saul? Anybody remember we kind of kicked this around? Why would God choose Saul? He, he handpicked him. Yes? Because uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, were using uh, Saul as a weapon against the body of Christ. Okay, I kind of like that when God takes what the enemy is using against you and reverses it. And yeah, I like that. Why else do you think God would choose Saul? And he's sending him to the Gentiles. You know, he tells Ananias, I have chosen him to be my vessel to go to the Gentiles. Saul, who's a Jew of all Jews, right? And uh, so God has a sense of humor. Um, but why else would he choose him? Yes. All right. What else? Okay. Practically, he knew lots of languages, uh, especially the universal languages of Latin and Greek, meaning... He was somebody who could go through the whole empire. Mm-hmm. All right, what else? So he was zealous for God? All right, yeah. Yeah, sometimes God sees somebody who's, in fact, I knew a preacher. Um, they called him Jumpin' Johnny because when he would worship, he was all over the place. He would work up a, a sweat by the time he got to the pulpit to preach. And then he would preach all over the place. He'd made you nervous. But he said he had been a mafia hitman in Chicago. And he, had, he ran drug rings. He ran prostitute rings. He did all kinds of stuff. Anyway, he became an informant. And they changed his name. And, you know, he became a preacher. <laughs> he got saved and then became an informant. Anyway, amazing story. He's a good friend. But he says the reason why he was so radical in his preaching and worship was because he was so radical for the devil. And, 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 and so, so we'll just say this with, with Saul. Who brought that up? Oh, you. Um, that he was so zealous and God said, here's somebody I could tap that zeal and use it for me. I like that. And he does that all the time with people. What else? Because um, Saul, he was well known Okay, yeah, well, it, I think we may have mentioned that last week, that Saul being converted showed the church there's no limits. That who can get saved, right? Uh, if he can get saved, anybody can get saved. Maybe y'all have known people like that. If God saved them, he can save anybody, right? And it's also, practically, he was a dual citizen, and as a dual citizen, he could go all over the Roman Empire with rights, he was dual cultural. He was a Hellenized Greek Jew and a Jew, uh, a very ingrained Jew, Jew in the uh, in the system. And he also had deep theological training. And so, as a Christian, he was able to dive into those Old Testament books and pull out Christ like that. He knew that word. And so, there was a lot of uh, pluses. Here's another question. Um, could he have resisted? 
Jesus said, all right, Saul knocks him on his back, says, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I'm Jesus of Nazareth, who you've been persecuting. And then Saul says, okay, what do I need to do? And he says, go, go to this house on Straight Street. But could Saul have said no? <laughs> All right. He was blind, so he didn't have a choice. Uh, kinda, kinda put in a position uh, where you know Jesus blinded him. But yeah, he could have, in anger, resisted. But even when he went to uh, Judas's house on Straight Street, Ananias meets him, and Ananias tells him the way of salvation. Saul could have resisted then too. No one made him go. No one made him. In fact, uh, Acts 20 and 19, when Paul's standing before King Agrippa, and uh, he says this to him, and he's recurs, telling his testimony. He says, yeah, King, I was not disobedient to that heavenly vision, meaning he could have disobeyed, but he didn't. He obeyed. And so, yeah, nothing about him was forced he wasn't made to do anything. Um, uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's see what happens here. Uh, in verse 17 through 19 now, let's get down to reading. Does somebody read that out loud, please? Okay, so how many days was he at the house of Judas? Anyone remember? Three, three days. So he went three days with no food or water. Mm -hmm. he, so he spent three days praying and fasting. Mm -hmm. And in the house of a disciple who, you know, exposed him uh, to the faith. And now Ananias shows up, sent by the Holy Spirit to him. And, and, and I think his credibility is such that he says, yeah... Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, sent me. And Saul knew, okay, he was really sent by Jesus. How did he know that Jesus appeared to me on the road, right? And remember, Ananias, if you didn't write this down last week, Ananias is considered one of the first prophets in the New Testament. The first prophets in the New Testament church. Because God prophetically told him what was going to happen in the future. Saul was going to be uh, a light to the Gentiles, a vessel to go to the nations and so forth. So he got a prophetic word about Saul and then he obeyed the Lord and comes to Saul. Um, and so he's operating in the Holy Spirit and the gifts here and he's operating as a prophet as well. All right, here's what I want to remind y'all. All right, this is a pattern. Is Ananias one of the 12 apostles? Yet, he lays hands on Saul, and he's healed of his blindness. He baptizes Saul, and he goes to lay hands on Saul to receive the Holy Spirit. See? And he's not, a, he's not one of the 12 apostles. The reason I keep pointing this out is because of this theology called cessation theology, which says, falsely, that all of the miracles and the signs and the wonders... And, and apostolic authority uh, was only for the 12 apostles. And when the 12 apostles died, so did signs, miracles, and, and Holy Spirit baptism and so forth. And they say that signs and miracles in the early church were up a sign of an apostle. And only the apostles performed this. And I'm saying, what Bible are they reading? Right? Because so far, who have we seen casting out devils, doing miracles, and, and preaching and baptizing. Who have we seen so far in Acts? Who? Philip? Ananias? Stephen? Yes. And, and, and one guy even said only the 12 apostles were given the Great Commission. 
to go preach to all nations, that that was an apostolic thing. Yet, when Saul began to preach the, uh, persecute the church, who went around everywhere preaching? The Jews, I mean the disciples. And the apostles specifically said they stayed in Jerusalem. But the church went everywhere, all through Judea and Samaria, preaching the gospel. That's in chapter 8. Uh, to e everywhere. The church went everywhere preaching. Uh, so these guys have an agenda, and but when you look through the book of Acts, their agenda unravels. God used all the church to go into all nations to preach, and God used non-apostles to preach, baptize, do miracles, cast out demons. Ananias, here he is. He wasn't a deacon even. He was a, he was a, was an apostle, but God set him aside. God could have sent Peter. Right? He could have sent John to go to him, but he didn't. He sends this dude named Ananias. And Ananias is in Damascus. He's not even Jerusalem. He's a, he's a believer in, in, in Damascus, in Syria, outside the border of Israel. All right? So Ananias, Ananias lays hands on Saul, and he's healed. Ananias baptizes Saul. Um, and Ananias said that he had come to pray for Saul to receive the Holy Spirit. We don't see it happen. Does it happen? Yeah, of course. He said, I'm coming to pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't get recorded. So we don't see it happen because it's not necessary. We already know. Remember we said in the book of Acts, we don't see every recording of people repenting but we know that's required for salvation, and it happened. We don't see every recording of people being water baptized, but we know that's what converts did, and we know it happened. We don't see every time people are baptized with the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues in the book of Acts, but we know it happened because this is a pattern that was happened through Acts. It's recorded three times in detail. But the other times, like here, he says, I've come to, to heal you of your sight and... Pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit. And a dis, it doesn't tell all the details except, you know, he got baptized and he ate something and he stayed there with those disciples for a few days. This is where he's getting trained, instruction, discipleship, being taught, uh, learning the history of what God has done so far amongst them. He's, he's hanging with these disciples. Any questions about this? This is where Paul really or Saul becomes uh, a disciple. Right. We don't see the account of he calling upon Christ to save him, but we know that he had to have done it. Um, but because the fact that he was water baptized means he did all the other prerequisites, right? Um, okay. Um, let's see, where do we want to skip to? All right, so here's some things that happens here at, with Saul. He's there for several days. First, he was there at, at Judas' house three days fasting and praying. Uh, he has this time with the Christians and gets instruction. Then Ananias visits him, and then he stays with them several days. He's learning and studying, immersing himself in Christ. And now Saul the theologian is not going to have a hard time seeing Christ in the Scriptures. And, and this is what we see in verse 20, someone read 20 through 22, um, because it doesn't take long, Saul's down to business. So someone read that out loud. Immediately he preached the, um, preached the Christ in the synagogue, that he is the Son of God. And all who heard were amazed and said, Is this not he who destroyed those who called on his name, on this name in Jerusalem, and has come here for that purpose? so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests. But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dealt in, who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. All right, excellent. So he immediately goes into the synagogues, and the very synagogues he was going to Damascus to root the Christians out of, now he's going there preaching Christ. That is how Christ turned things around. And I love it. Uh, and, and so he's, his credibility 
is in verse 21 because they're saying, isn't this the same guy who destroyed those who called on Jesus in Jerusalem? And wasn't he coming here under orders from the chief priest to do so? But now look, he's preaching Christ. Think about how much credibility was in that. What changed? Why did he turn course? Why did he go from persecutor to preacher? Something must have dramatically happened to this guy. And can you imagine the open ears that he had? Uh, I mean, there, that I think his credibility, we could have said, oh, no, he, who are you preaching to us? You, you are there arresting us. No, it was the reverse. Wow, what happened to you that you went from persecutor to preacher? And so his credibility is pretty powerful. And, um, uh, and in verse 22, notice this, he increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews, proving that Jesus is the Christ. Here's the master theologian that, that Saul was. Now, now, let me ask y'all something. For, for the ministry to become a pastor, missionary, evangelist, clergy, ordained, uh, is it biblical that you have required training first? Or who says you should have required training first? Who says no? Who says you should, you should have some type of training or education to go into ministry full time? Okay. Who says no? Okay. Moses? No, yeah, Moses kind of had some training. God, yeah, he had Moses. He spent twice 40 days alone with God. With him. Intense. And also, if you look at the life of Moses, his 40 years in the wilderness was prep training. He's, he spent 40 years tending sheep before God called him to lead out people into the wilderness. So he was, uh, he was well... He was well versed in the, the desert wilderness. And he went from leading sheep to leading people. So he did have, I think, had some training. And the fact that he confronted Pharaoh, his training growing up in Egypt also qualified him to do that. He spoke Egyptian. He knew the court. He knew Egyptian culture and ways. He was very qualified to go stand before Pharaoh. Right. And uh, so I, I think he had training. Um, and, and I would say this, I believe you should have training. Now, does it mean it has to amount to a degree? No, that's not a biblical teaching. You have to have a college degree to be in ministry. But did the disciples, the apostles have training? Absolutely. They sat three years at the feet of a master rabbi and had hands-on intense training uh, and internship before they were filled with the Spirit and sent out. So, yeah, they had training. But here, Saul, Saul just got called and he's preaching a few days later. <laughs> Why, yeah. so, so what do you think's happening with him? The rest of the apostles had to sit at the feet. They got to sit at the feet of Jesus for three years, right? And they still weren't quite getting it right. But, but Saul, why all of a sudden he's right out there preaching right away? Fear God, maybe. And fear Jesus, Holy Spirit. Well, they all had the Holy Spirit. We already knew the scriptures, so now he's connected. I think, I think God, I think took God took the training he had because he was trained in the Word. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, uh, as a, which was one of the high schools of the day, uh, religious schools. So he did have religious school training. Uh, so that's why he knew the word so well. So yes, it wasn't Christian training, it was religious training, but God, now that he was anointed and his eyes opened, he realized at his own fingertips, he knew what the scripture said. Oh, oh, okay. Ladies first. Ladies. No, I was just thinking about um, the three days fasting and praying. It doesn't say that. 
say what experience he was having just mm -hmm. the Lord was on his spirit. Mm -hmm. So who knows right. that kind of spiritual mm -hmm. moment with the Holy Spirit. Oh yeah, no doubt. Yeah. Well, yeah, and then he has this, I won't say traumatic, but it was kind of a trauma. At the same time, it was an amazing um, experiential moment where he encountered the risen Christ. I mean, that was big. <laughs> so here's the thing with it. Saul was religiously trained, fact. Highly religious trained, better than all the other apostles, aside from that they sat under Jesus' feet and got his direct teachings. Saul had to learn what Jesus said later. How did Saul learn about what Jesus said? He had to learn it from the other disciples. He didn't know. But he did know the scripture in the Old Testament because it would be several years before there was a New Testament Bible. They didn't have Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They had Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John alive telling it orally, but they didn't have it written. And they didn't have the epistles because 27, I mean, uh, most of the epistles were written by Saul. So it, he hadn't written the epistles yet, right? And so, so they had no New Testament scripture. They only had the Old Testament scripture at this point to preach the gospel. And that was something Saul knew real well. Yeah. For my name's sake. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, so I don't know when he got that revelation that he was going to suffer, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, we're going to find out though. He kind of starts suffering right away. Yeah. Yes. He kind of starts suffering right away because. Think about this. Well, let me, I'm going to jump ahead of myself. Let's, let's finish up 9 tonight. Um, look at verse 23 and 25. Someone read that out loud. All right, let's stop right there. All right, so he's kind of already starting, right? He went from, from prestige to being an outlaw. He went from being climbing up the social ladder, being interconnected with the high priest. Uh, uh, you know, he was a member of the elite uh, leadership, member of the council, uh, so he had a lot going for him as a young man. And now he has given it all up and he has lost it all, right? Does he remember what Paul says about that later on in one of his epistles? About, about it? About yeah. Yeah. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, he said, I count all that loss as nothing but dung, right? Manure, right? And uh, so, so that I can gain Christ. That meant nothing to me. All that he lost, he said, was nothing but like, it's just trash. And, and um, so, which is pr pretty profound. By the way, um, I just want to point out that this is one of the strong arguments to the resurrection of Jesus. Because nobody in their, in their right mind who had position, power, status, career path, wealth, uh, uh, connections, climbing upwardly mobile, would walk away from that for a lie or a philosophy. You know, if you had... A, a, a rough, bad grammar, stinky fisherman, uneducated, come tell you, oh yeah, our new religion, uh, it's the real way, and come follow Jesus. And, well, he was killed on the cross, but yeah, we believe he's alive. Would he give up everything for that? Nah. No. But 
But the fact that he walked away from all that he had, something had to have happened. Something had to have shooken him to the core. And, and he tells the testimony over and over and over, I was visited by Jesus and he's alive. And so this is one of the power, Paul's conversion is one of the powerful arguments that Christ early on uh, what, that he had indeed risen and that Saul saw him. Uh, so just want to point that out. Uh, Paul later on will say, I saw him late in life, you know, out of time, but, but I got to see him last of all. Now notice here, it says in verse 23, he's being so effective and, and because he knows the word better than all these Jews and, um, they plot to kill him. Now pay attention to this expression, the Jews plotted to kill him. That doesn't mean the general Jewish race caught to kill him, because guess what? They were all Jews. Paul was Jew. The 12 apostles were Jewish. Everybody in the church at this time, tens of thousands by now, they're all Jewish. So when they say the Jews were out to kill him, they weren't talking about the Jewish people as a people. This is an expression meaning the scribes, the priests, and the uh, council, right? The leadership, the same people that sought to kill Christ and arrested him. The elders, the council, the priests and the scribes, the Pharisees and the Sadducees that made this up, those are the ones that were seeking to put him to death. And so the very first time um, uh, we see this image of rage that one of their own, if you can imagine the rage, that one of their own, now linked to this new group of Jesus followers, and imagine the alarm uh, of those who plotted the arrest and the crucifixion of Jesus just a couple years before, they're still alive. And now they tried to suppress the news of his resurrection, and now one of their very own is preaching Christ resurrected. That's alarming to them. Their golden boy, and, and, and so, yeah, in a sense, you're right. And, and so, so now he is preaching Christ resurrected, and they know how powerful that is, that one of their own people are now preaching Jesus, and people are going to say, wait a minute, there must be something to this. To this. And, and so they have to get rid of Saul, right? Um, it was imperative that one so influential be eliminated um so in verse 25 it says the disciples took him by night now it's not the 12 remember they're in jerusalem uh this is a reference to the members of the church and the very same people once persecuted him persecuted by him are now aiding his escape which is a beautiful thing about the relationship in the body of christ right enemies now brothers you know, strangers, now family. And, uh, and, and so they, they, they take him in. And also notice that Christians now in general are being referred to as disciples. Yeah. Right. Any questions on this? All right. So, so let's read this next section here, verse 26 through 30, someone please. Thank you. So let's introduce Barnabas here. Uh, he's a major character in the early church. And so uh, uh, since he's introduced here, I want you all to know some things about Barnabas. Uh, one, he's a 
a prominent disciple in the early church and a man of means, wealthy. The first time we really meet him is in Acts chapter 4. Do you all remember what he's doing there? Acts chapter 4, he was one of the guys, the first guy recorded that sold land and took the money and gave it to the early church, right? Right before Ananias and Sapphira did it. Uh, and, and so he was the first, and so he was a man of means. He was well respected in the church, and the fact that he speaks up on behalf of Saul to the apostles shows how much influence and respect he had. Uh, and so, so they didn't want to receive him, but Barnabas brings him before the apostles and speaks on his behalf, and, and they hear him out. Uh, Barnabas and Saul are going to become lifelong friends. Uh, ministry throughout their lives. They're going to be partners in ministry. They're going to do mission trips together. Um, Barnabas will travel with him, and he's going to be mentioned in Paul's letters later on. Uh, so he becomes... Uh, one, his defender here, but he's going to become his ministry partner later. Um, history says that Barnabas was later martyred on the island of Cyprus. And uh, uh, tradition has, has it that he founded a church there, preached and planted a church there, and there is a Greek Orthodox church in Cyprus that claims to have its origins all the way back to Barnabas. So it could be, but uh, history says that's where he was killed for the faith. Uh, a minority, a minority of theologians out there say that Barnabas is the writer of the book of Hebrews. And I've heard arguments why they believe he was, um, but the majority of people believe Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is not identified, doesn't identify the author. But when I ever read through Hebrews and I get to the end of it, it's very Paul sounding. But at the same time, if Barnabas was a lifelong ministry partner of Paul, he also would be Paul sounding, right? But we don't know. But there's, there's some that say that Barnabas wrote the book of Hebrews, but we don't know. Um, so he was received by the apostles and Saul freely becomes attached to the church and he starts doing what? Preaching in Jerusalem, right? And he's especially effective with the Hellenists. Anyone remember what Hellenists are? We talked about it at the beginning of Acts. Greek-speaking Jewish people, yeah. Uh, there's two reasons they would be Hellenists. One, when the Greek Empire... Um, acquired the land of Israel under Alexander, uh, Alexander the Great. Uh, there were colonies, the Greeks colonized it, and there were some Jews that um, intermixed with the Greeks, uh, and, uh, or there were some Jews that, uh, Greeks that converted to Judaism. And either way, they created a Greek-Jewish culture, but they were practicing the Jewish religion. Another reason is some of these Jews formed uh, part of, were part of the expansion of colonies. And so there were big Jewish colonies in Alexandria. There were Greek colonies and uh, synagogues in Corinth. There were synagogues everywhere the Greek empire were, and there were Jewish communities there. Those Jews lived there for generations, and their kids now all spoke Greek. Some of them didn't speak Hebrew at all because they grew up in the Greek culture, and so now they have kids and grandkids who are Jews, but they speak Greek. They were called Hellenized Jews, right? Uh, they often would make pilgrimages to Jerusalem. Paul's in Jerusalem, and he encounters some Hellenist Jews, and he's very effective because he is technically a Hellenist Jew. He grew up in Cyprus, I mean Tarsus. And uh, Tarsus is in Asia Minor, and it was a major uh, hub of commerce and education and very Greek. He would have grown up learning the Greek uh, philosophers and Greek mythology and Greek history and the Greek language. So when he's talking to these Hellenists, he, he knows their language and he knows how they think and he knows their Greek philosophical minds and he's very effective with them. And he knows the word. It's kind of like me growing up 
I was raised in the Catholic Church. I was raised, unlike a lot of Catholics, who um, don't know much about their doctrine. They can't explain things. I did. I mean, I was digging it out because I thought I was going to be a priest. And so I was very, very faithful in my Catholic walk and understood our teachings well. And so when I got saved, even to this day, uh, though I don't encounter as many, um, I've always been real effective reaching Catholics. I've led lots of Catholics to the Lord through my, since high school even. My best friend uh, was uh, one of the first Catholics I led to the Lord. He pastors the Church of God in Baytown, Texas today. Uh, but God's just always give because I know the thinking, I know how they speak, I know the lingo, um, I can talk from their frame of reference and uh, um, address some of their th- uh, aunt questions. And this is how Saul was uh, with the Hellenists, right? But the fact that he was effective kind of alarmed them, right? This guy, he's too good. We got to shut him. He's going to empty out our synagogues. He's going to convert all our followers. Our financial base is going to be re- removed. We got to stop him, right? He's already making enemies. And Marina, as you pointed out, this is the suffering that Paul's building up for himself, right? Y'all think that Paul's suffering is a, due to uh, sowing and reaping? He persecuted the church, sowed some seed, and now, and now he's going to have to suffer a little bit as a Christian. <laughs> You don't think so? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is how he works. Sowing and reaping. The law of sowing and reaping is real New Testament and Old Testament. It's mentioned twice in the New Testament, one dealing with money and one dealing with our, our deeds. Sowing and reaping is a real law. But, but is God applying it here is the question. So and then reaping? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, when that's happening like with Paul. For example, like the person that you just mentioned earlier, the one that's in mafia, is he going to be persecuted? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You need to sit down with him. Uh, yeah. Is that still happening right now? Yeah. What's y'all's thoughts? He's, yeah, so and then reaping happens now. Even Christians can sow good and bad seed that come back to them. Absolutely. Don't, don't make a mistake. That's a fact. I, as a Christian, if I, even, there's a lot of things I do as a pastor that I do because I believe in the law of sowing and reaping. For example, I respect my leaders, Brother Moore and everyone up. Um, I don't trash them. I respect them. I follow them. I obey them, even if I don't like it. Why? Because if I don't, how am I going to expect those I'm leading to do the same? Because I believe in the law of sowing and reaping. Um, we faithfully report to our ministry covering and send in our tithes of tithes. I do it faithfully because if I don't, then I'm sowing seeds and then I'm, how can I expect y'all to faithfully give and tithe if I'm not doing it? I, I sow what I want to see come back. It is a spiritual law. Yes. And even in the life of a Christian, it works. Yeah. Even though uh, we don't like to think that, um, that's just that's just the truth. He redeems us, he saves us, but unfortunately, he still says some bad things that may happen and some good things that he does. Yeah. He gives us grace through it, but still. Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments? I mean, who agrees with that? He said that's not what's happening with Saul in his person. I mean, I'm just saying it could be. The scripture never tells us that's what's happening with Saul, but, but it could be. I asked the question. He just tells us that he just tells us the Lord told him. I think it's just the nature of the mission. Yeah. I mean, if you look at James' mission, I mean he was forgiven. He really turned around. So it's not yeah. like he's been dipping his out, you know, going back and forth. <laughs> Okay. Because he turned it around. Um, had he continued, yes. So I really feel that it's more like his 
because it raises the issue that they're gone. Okay. Yeah. That's my sole issue. I would, say, yeah. I would say it's important to separate punishment from reaping. Yeah. You have to separate those two things. Yeah. God was not punishing him. Right. right. It's a natural law that happens, yeah. and it's kind of we're in, we're in, I won't say we're in charge, mm -hmm. but we are responsible. I reap what I personally sow mm -hmm. as spiritual law, mm -hmm. um, good or bad, yeah. right? And so, you know, if you understand this and you sow righteousness, we reap righteous things. So sowing righteousness strategically and on purpose is really a beautiful lifestyle. But, but yeah, you're right. It was the nature of the time to preach the gospel was dangerous. Mm -hmm. The fact that all of the apostles died uh, yeah. preaching the gospel, <laughs> except John, he was boiled in oil, but he lived and yeah. dry, he, he dried, <laughs> but he died a natural death. Um, so they all suffered, and they were not persecuted as a church. Probably olive oil, but he was, he was boiled in oil for and then imprisoned on Patmos, but he survived the boy. The boy. Yep. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So, but here's a point I want to make, guys, before we run out of time, that Paul was so effective with these Hellenists because he was a Hellenistic Greek, you know, exposed Jew. Here's a note about evangelism. Every week we talk about some points about evangelism. And evangelism, in evangelism, reaching those who are of like culture and background is wisdom. Now God will send people who are nothing like the culture to, to go reach a culture. But the most effective, Paul so effective with the Hellenists because he was a Hellenist Jew. And that's why he was so effective uh, with them because he could relate to them. And if you read some of the epistles, even his sermons at Athens, and he, he quotes Greek philosophers. Why? Because he knew and he caught their attention, right? He was effective. And when we're reaching people, um, we're most effective reaching our like culture, military reaching military, old folk reaching old folk, young families, <laughs> right? Y'all can talk, Yeah, y'all can strike up a conversation about your kidney, and then next thing you know, you're talking about the healing presence of the Lord, right? Um, so, uh, Young families reaching young families, you know, singles reaching single students reaching students. And you students have been amazing doing that here, right? Y'all multiply yourselves. And so uh, that, is, that is really your first harvest field are those who you most can identify with uh, and most effective with. Um, the, uh, I read a book years ago called uh, I Speak With No Accent. And it was uh, at a time where missionaries were changing. It used to be, you know, you'd get send a missionary, you know, to Africa or the Far East or some remote island, and they'd go and live in a hut and reach the natives, right? Often it would mean they westernized them. You know, they'd go and start making them dress like we dress and, you know, pick up our, our culture. And that style of missionary work is long dissolved uh, as a wrong approach. Um, the book, I Speak With No Accent, is advocating that we train locals to reach locals. The new mission approach is we train the locals to reach their own people. And, and it, it's really biblical, and this is why Paul was so effective. So keep that in mind, that there's a, there are people you're going to be more effective in reaching, right? Ex-addicts will reach addicts better, right? Uh, and you can go down the long list, right? Okay, everyone good? Well, then we're, we're running out of time. Let me come on. We're going to finish this tonight. Yeah. All right. So, so again, the church sneaks him away, and where do they send him? To Tarsus, his hometown. 
Say, child, you need to get out of town for a while. Get out of the country and go back to Tarsus, and that's where Saul goes. Now, this is key because this is a transitional, temporary transitional time. Saul gets out of the way, so Peter now can come to forefront. And so Saul's out of the country. Now we come and we revert down to Peter. So when this happens, Saul's agitating the leadership, but he's gone And this brings some peace, and it points out the church is now through Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. That's all we're talking about. Uh, Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And what's happening? They were multiplied. I like this because up to this point, we kept seeing God added. God added to the church. Many were added to the church. 3,000 were added. Now it's multiplying. And that means a lot rapid growth. And, and, uh, and that's the kind of stuff I want to see happen here. I don't want to just add to City Mission. I want to multiply in this community. But, but I want to point out something that never changes so far in the book of Acts. Um, they were launched in power on the day of Pentecost. God grew the church. They had this mass revival. God grew the church. They go through this fiery persecution. God grew the church. Now they have a period of peace. God's multiplying the church. Does it matter what's going on? No. God grew the church in all circumstances, in all situations. That was the constant no matter what was going on. And that's something we have to remember, that Jesus said the gates of hell will not prevail. I'm building this church. Uh, that's a reminder to us tonight. Um, so I also want to point out here the use of the word churches, plural. Notice up to this point, you mostly see the word church, singular, and the church this, and the church that, and the church. Now we're seeing churches. Why is that? I'm going to run out of time. Um, what, what, what's happening here? What version do you have? Mm. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I know that there are some Bibles that will put church singular, but it is in the Greek. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It, and those are more of... Um, Those are more of, those aren't true translations. They are, what's the word I'm looking for? Thought for thought. Huh? Thought for thought, thought, yeah. But there's a word for that. Uh, And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're going to dig deep into something like this and you want to notice this transition, it won't be in that. You know, like Message Bible or words, those type of Bibles are thought for thought rather than translation, which is why it's good to stick to, I like the new King James. Some people like King James, but King James also has English that diverts us away from the translation because it's English that no longer exists, right? So the new King James is King James integrity of translation, translation, but with English that makes sense. Um, New American Standard is also pretty good. And uh, uh, when it comes to translation, and uh, I'm impressed with the ESV, English Standard Version, as well. ESV, yeah. It has pictures? I mean, ESV also takes positive. Oh, okay. All right. That's cool. Uh, but but let y'all know that this is, this is New King James and that in the original language it's plural. All right? All right? Does it mean that it's a mistranslation? It's not really. Because the church universal is made up of the churches, but the truth is, it's plural here. And from the rest of the book of Acts, you're pretty much going to see often the use of the plural. And it is a transition. And the reason there's a transition is because, remember the first two years of the church, where was everyone located? In Jerusalem. So there was one big mega church in the city of Jerusalem under the apostles. 
The apostles have stayed in Jerusalem, and the church is now scattered all over the countryside, Samaria, Judea, right, and Galilee. And so they're everywhere. So now you have these small communities of churches, and each one is an ecclesia. They have a gathering point. They're gathering at Joppa. They're gathering at Bethlehem. They're gathering in Samaria. They gather here, right? And so wherever they gather, it was an ecclesia, right? I don't have time to really get into this, but we're going to probably talk more about it real soon in Acts. The importance of the ecclesia, the gathering of the body, uh, is happening pretty quick here. And the fact that now we're seeing ecclesias gather in various regions, but yet whenever there's controversy or conflict or there's a need for confirmation or there's a need for order, they always refer to the church in Jerusalem where the apostles are. And so we're starting to see the structure of the church happen pretty quick, is my point. When I read it, I just really thought it was called the body of Christ throughout all the world. And I saw the singular structure. Yes. But where they gather is going to be local. And then every one of those local gatherings is an ecclesia. Correct. I just saw it as the body of Christ throughout all the land. All right. Let's read this section here. We really don't have a lot of time. Someone read this like an auctioneer really quick. 32 through 35. All right, awesome. So now Peter comes on the scene and we start getting a focus uh, on, on Peter's ministry. So, so the town of Lydda is now called Lod. It's in modern Israel. It's about 25 miles northwest of Jerusalem. And uh, I want to point out here that we're starting to see the word saints used in reference to the church uh, in verse 32. We see the word disciples, but we also now start seeing the word saints used or sainted or those made holy. We're going to see that intermixed through the book of Acts, uh, disciples or saints, sometimes the believers. Uh, but the word saint there is one made holy, one who's been made holy. Um, and uh, so uh, many uh, healings take place in the book of Acts. We have already seen that miracles were happening, many unusual miracles are happening at the hands of Peter. They're not all recorded, just like all the miracles of Jesus aren't recorded. In fact, in the Gospel of John, how many miracles are, are, are recorded in John? Seven. Only seven, but Jesus healed thousands. Uh, John only, re healed, only records seven because they were strategic to his, prove his point. And, and here we have a healing of all the healings that happened, this one is a given, we get an account of it, and there's a reason for it. Um, so we have this guy named Aeneas, and he had been lame for eight years, which means that his condition was well known. And so his healing caught attention. If there was somebody in the small village that everyone knew was the lame guy, um, and all of a sudden he's healed, everyone's going to know something happened. Something notable. And so Peter, like the lame man at the gate, uses his faith and authority to release healing. Now notice what Peter does not say here. Peter doesn't say, I heal you, Aeneas. Peter was just the agent of faith and authority, but he says, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. That was a powerful statement of authority and faith. Rarely do we see people operate in that kind of authority, right? I was talking to one of the young guys I'm mentoring in ministry right now, and we were talking about praying for the sick. And he says, you know, I pray for the sick, but I just kind of pray, Lord, if it's your will, uh, you know, would you, would you please heal? And uh, 
I said, you need to stop praying like that. <laughs> yeah, like, like you're apologizing for asking Jesus to heal somebody. Uh, I said, you need to learn to start praying with more authority and let it fall where it falls. It's up to the Lord how and what and when he does it. You use authority when you pray for the sick. This is what Peter does. He says, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. And then he gives a command, arise and make up your bed and walk. Powerful authority. And the healing miracle here was meant to do only one thing, point to Jesus. It didn't promote Peter's ministry. It didn't get ratings on his TV show. It wasn't to, for him to you know, have a TV commercial showing what God's doing in him. No, it pointed to Christ, and the result is that all of Lydda and the neighboring village, Sharon, uh, turned to Jesus. Here's another evangelism note, and I think I'm going to have to stop there. How much time? Oh, wow. um, and um, here's another evangelism note I want to leave with you all tonight. When was the last time we made an impact enough to gain attention towards Christ. When's the last time, like Peter makes this impact, healing Aeneas, who everyone knew in that village was sick for, uh, lame for eight years, um, and now he's healed and catches everyone's attention, the whole village comes to Christ. When's the last time we, the church, have made an impact in the community that caught attention? That's something to think about as we start turning our eyes and ears towards evangelism. Right. Questions or comments? We're going to look next week at another miracle that Peter does, uh, and then we're going to look at what God does to him, through him, in Acts chapter 10 with the house of Cornelius, a major turning point for the church. Uh, so Peter, God's not done with Peter, God's setting him up. All right, we're closing. Don't forget, guys, Friday evening, Good Friday, 1900, right here by candlelight. We have tables set up, white tablecloth, and we celebrate and reenact, in a sense, uh, the, the upper room last supper together uh, with communion and foot washing. It's intimate. It's, it's a beautiful time of testimony and, and readings and prayer. It's not a long service. Uh, we're out pretty quick. So if you come late, all you watching by television, if you come late, uh, 15 minutes, you, you missed a lot of it, right? Let's be here on time and come reverently uh, as we worship together on Friday night. And I hope you've been inviting your 17 people uh, to be here with us Easter. If you haven't signed up to bring something, uh, uh, sign up and let's come together and let's celebrate royally uh, this weekend. God bless you. Uh, close us in prayer, someone. Uh, Brother Holder, would you do so? I know you, you preached hard on Sunday and you've been working hard this week getting transit. <laughs> But we want you to go ahead and sleep. sleep.